Hi guys, it's great to be here in Singapore. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of customer research, right? So in, in this context, that's you guys. So I wanted to find out uh, who, who actually lives and works here in Singapore. Uh, it's a pretty good uh, people, yeah, it's about a third roughly. Um, who's a little bit further out in sort of Southeast Asia? Yep. Uh, it's about the same, uh, maybe further out into the sort of greater a Asia, sort of up to China, out towards India, the Stans, in, anyone from a bit further out? And then anyone even further out from Australia or sort of Europe? Ah, there's always Australians, right? <laughs> you guys are everywhere. All right, go as you go. Um, <laughs> Great, good. So, um, so I'm Ken Chin. I'm the Chief Product Officer for Seek Asia. Um, in Australia, you know Seek as you know a great place to find a job. In this region, you probably know us better as Job Street and Jobs DB. Uh, so we're an online jobs marketplace, and our purpose is to improve lives through better careers. And that's what I'm hoping to do today. Um, I'm actually hoping to add a little bit of the, the local flavor uh, to a bit of uh, career advice in terms of my own experience. Um, so, a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Penang in Malaysia. Uh, my parents are Malaysian Chinese. Uh, yes, so I have crazy parents too. Um, uh, but I grew up in Australia, right? Uh, I grew up in Perth, in fact. Um, and then I spent sort of nine years in London. Uh, that's where I met these guys from Mind the Product, uh, Martin and his, and his crew. Um, and then I moved out to Asia just two years ago. So, if you're a local, you would call me a banana, right? So essentially, on the outside, I'm Asian, you know, I look Asian, but on the inside, I'm pretty much white, okay? Um, so, so in terms of my career, like I, w I was uh, with eBay for nine years, I was in um, BCG Digital Ventures, uh, I was part of the founding team in the London office for, for, that, uh, for that business. Uh, and I relocated to Australia, uh, to, um, to Asia about two years ago. Um, and I currently live in, in Kuala Lumpur, that's the regional headquarters for Seek Asia. Um, but I've lived and worked uh, with many teams all over the world, right? Um, and in the course of my meandering career, um, I've had the op opportunity to observe and understand how product teams operate in different parts of the world. And in particular, the contrast between how teams work uh, here in Asia versus uh, e either Europe or the US or, or even Australia as well. And the good news is that it's pretty much the same, right? Um, the, the product managers here in Singapore have the same challenges as the product managers in, in, um, in Silicon Valley. Um, I guess the, the main differences are really just a function of timing and a function of market maturity, right? So Silicon Valley is pretty sophisticated, same with Europe, they're not far behind. Um, in Asia, the tech ecosystem here is still pretty much in its infancy, um, and the talent pool is still sort of developing and emerging. But there are some differences um, that I've noticed anyway, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to focus on today. Um, so I hope to provide some career advice to you guys uh, if you, like me, have crazy Asian parents, um, or, and, and you maybe aspire to work in an MNC or a large global tech company, um, and even if you don't have crazy Asian parents, uh, this might help you understand some of your uh, Asian counterparts here um, in this part of the world. But before I get into that, I need to give you a very short history lesson. And it begins with two dudes. Um, two great thinkers in history, in fact. Uh, so I would argue that these two people are probably the most influential people in terms of how we think and how we solve problems today. One comes from the East and dominates how we uh, educate people here in, in Asia and how we think. The other, very similar, but from the West. Both were philosophers, both served in the military, both served in government. Um, can anyone guess who they might be? No, no takers? Um, 
One last clue, they lived roughly two and a half thousand years ago. All right? So who are they? So they, they are Confucius and Socrates. All right? So Confucius apparently has really bad teeth. You can see that from this portrait here. Um, Socrates, he was considered ugly but brilliant. Um, so let's understand a little bit about how their philosophies affect us today. All right, so Confucius. Um, so he lived in a time of war uh, between neighboring states. There were frequent rebellions uh, against you know, local rulers and, and, and city, uh, um, city governments. So much of his philosophy is geared towards living in harmony, good government, and avoiding war. Right? He wrote many of the Chinese uh, classics. Um, he has many teachings, but I'm going to focus on just a few. Uh, one of them is respect your elders. Man, that got drilled to, into me as a kid. Um, and to some extent, this, this uh, applies to anyone in authority as well, right? So whether that's your local king or um, a, a local um, official. There was also a lot of emphasis in terms of social structure and social harmony. Um, and in terms of education, um, he really valued the cultivation of knowledge and learning by example. Now let's contrast that with Socrates. So Socrates, um, he's an intellectual, uh, he's a troublemaker in Athens, right? So he's a Greek. He made many powerful enemies in Athens, and in fact, that sort of ended in his demise. He was tried, found guilty, and then executed. I think he drank hemlock. I don't know what hemlock is, but it sounds pretty painful. Um, but he's hugely influential in terms of Western education, right? So he never actually wrote anything. Um, we only hear about him from the writings of his students, uh, predominantly Plato and Xenophon. Um, but he created a method of teaching by having students develop an opinion uh, and then ask them a whole series of questions, right, where they had to justify their answers. And this approach became known as the Socratic method. Um, it's very good for developing critical thinking. Um, it trains you to anticipate questions. It trains you to be prepared to sort of defend your position. Uh, and this, in turn, led to hypothesis testing, which, in turn, led to the scientific method, um, and whereby you had to develop a hypothesis and prove or disprove it using observational data. And this is the, the crux of it, right? So this is where our development methodologies come from. Because when you think about Lean Startup, um, all of the core principles are you know, about, about experimentation, right? You need to uh, run a series of experiments and then justify it with data, uh, whether it's A-B testing or, um, or, or other evidence. So on one hand, you have a philosophy and a set of core values in Asia that really tries to avoid conflict, whilst in the West, you've got an underlying philosophy and, um, uh, and values around harnessing conflict in order to have robust thinking and then ensure that the best ideas actually move forward. So enough with the history lesson. Um, what does that mean for us? Um, in terms of um, the, the modern context of product delivery in Asia, you know, the, as I said, the, the dominant approaches come, generally come out of Silicon Valley, um, and they're fundamentally kind of Socratic and, and Western in their, in their view of the world. Whilst local culture uh, here in Asia tends to be based on a lot of those Confucian values. Right? So this leads to some really interesting behaviors uh, and things that I've noticed. So let me give you advice, some advice, if you're a product manager in Asia uh, with crazy Asian parents. Um, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's my baggage. Um, anyway, uh, so, um, and, and some of you might also be struggling with these same challenges that I did when I was going through my, my uh, career as well. Um, and alternatively, um, if you don't have crazy Asian parents, then this might help you understand your colleagues a little bit better as well. So the first one I want to talk about is conflict avoidance. Um, this is actually one of the core behaviors that I see um, in a lot of teams and a lot of individuals uh, here, and it drives a lot of kind of re really weird things. Um, 
So there are many cultural norms here in Asia that help you avoid conflict. Uh, so for example, it's kind of considered a bit rude to disagree with people in public, um, especially if it's someone in authority. Um, not, it's, it's kind of seen as not giving them face uh, and a sign of disrespect, right? So that's kind of one example. Another example is maybe when someone displays openly uh, anger uh, at a meeting or, or frustration. Uh, you'll notice that the whole room suddenly gets really quiet. Um, and there's that sort of stunned silent, nobody, stun silence. Nobody really knows how to handle it. Um, so I know this can happen because I do it, right? I, I still catch myself doing this occasionally as well. And it, and it took me a long time to really become aware of it and to, to, to really try and figure out how, uh, what to do about it. Um, another example of the, where this uh, behavior can, can be a problem is in team development, right? So you might be familiar with this kind of four stages of team development, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, and typically what happens is that uh, a team, a you know, brand new team, brand new bunch of people will, will go into the storming stage, but everyone's a bit hesitant, everyone's sort of avoiding conflict, and then they'll back away from a difficult conversation. And then they'll go into storming again, and then everyone will back away from a difficult conversation. Um, so you might see teams kind of get stuck in this loop for a little while, um, and find it really difficult to get through that storming stage into norming and then performing, right? Um, so at some level, uh, conflict is actually a good thing, right? Um, in fact, the highest performance teams that I've ever worked in um, have lots of conflict, but the biggest difference is that they really know how to resolve it. Um, so you kind of have to learn how to embrace conflict. Right, and what do I mean by conflict? I, I don't mean like direct personal conflict. Uh, I think you're an idiot, I hate you. Uh, it's, it's, it feels really good, but it's not very helpful. Um, so what I'm referring to is really the, the conflict of ideas, right? You really want the best ideas to win. And, the type, and this type of energy can actually be a very stimulating and creative thing, right? It really gets the best out of people if you can uh, really pull it off. So good teams, as I said, they really know how to manage conflict and know how to resolve conflict. Um, and there's a few things that I've noticed that really help with this, right? So first of all, you need a f at least a few people in, in the team to have that courage to not back away from a difficult conversation, right? And that helps train the rest of the team. Um, you need to be able to actively listen to each other, right? That can be a bit of a, a challenge sometimes, especially with you know, senior people. Um, and you really need to sort of go and seek first to understand and then be understood. Uh, and there's a few other ways of, of getting through conflict as well. So uh, disagree and commit, for example, is one technique for using, uh, that people use in order to, to get through um, these kinds of um, conflicts. Uh, you might be able to actually um, articulate why you disagree, but even though you disagree, you'll say, actually, the group thinks this, we're gonna, we want to want to go in this direction, I disagree, this is why, but I'm just gonna to commit to it anyway, right? So that's a really mature and, and useful way of, of getting through that type of conflict. And another, another way of doing this is also to use evidence, like A-B testing or user research. That does take a lot longer, so you can't use it for everything, right? But for the really big questions, it can be very, very useful. So overcoming um, this kind of challenge will be personally very difficult. I certainly found it very uh, difficult when I was uh, uh, sort of grappling with this as well. But I was really lucky. I, I had an amazing uh, manager at eBay uh, while I was in London, and he really sort of helped reframe conflict in this more positive way, as this sort of positive energy for creativity. And he gave me a lot of coaching to actually overcome this, uh, this fear of conflict. The second thing that I wanted to talk about was being an introvert. So you might be surprised to learn that I'm actually strongly introverted. Uh, I've been described as the most extroverted introvert anyone's ever met. <laughs> uh, but I've trained myself to be an extrovert, right? Um, I have an extrovert battery that lasts for about 16 hours, and then I curl up into a little ball, and I don't want to talk to anyone, right? Um, you might see that at the after party. <laughs> Don't know. Um, anyway, I've noticed that there tends to be a higher proportion of introverts here in Asia, 
And the level of introversion can be a little bit more extreme as well, right? It's a very generalized, you know, generalized statement. Um, for some people, it's just kind of hard to express your ideas. For other people, it's uh, more difficult to sort of present in front of the public or in, in front of management. But these skills are like super important as, as product managers, right? You've got to be able to manage stakeholders. You've got to be able to communicate well and to be able to present you know, what the team is doing and their progress and what outcomes you're trying to achieve. So it's super important skills. Um, so if you are an introvert, uh, then I highly recommend uh, reading this book called Quiet by Susan Cain. Um, she actually studies uh, introverts uh, and in her book, she actually describes many of the advantages of being in an introvert as well. So this book actually changed my life. It really helped me understand why I was an introvert, you know, what does that mean for my career? Um, but it also g gave me an, an insight into some of the superpowers we, we have as introverts as well. You're going to have to find that out by reading the book yourself, uh, or at least watch her TED talk. Um, uh, so, so that's a, a, a super great place to start. Um, but as I said, you know, being a, a, an effective communicator is a really important part of being a product manager. And it takes practice, uh, and you need to build up your uh, confidence. Um, so some things you might try to get started, because it's pretty intimidating sometimes, right, uh, getting up in front of a crowd. So some easy ways to get started is singing at a karaoke bar, <laughs> all right? Um, you're on stage, you're in front of people, Soon you start to normalize, you know, being in the spotlight. So that, that's one option. Um, impromptu drama classes is another really good way of doing this as well, right? Helps you think on your feet, um, be able to respond uh, to things that are happening around you. Uh, I, I do a lot of mentoring, uh, both within my company and outside of my company. Um, one of the suggestions that I got from one of my men mentees, mentee? Men yeah, mentees, uh, is poetry recital. Um, and I thought that was a brilliant idea, right? Uh, it's a nice way of sort of getting out in front of doing a little bit more of a, a presentation style thing, but you know, it, it, it's a great way to start. And then if you, um, if you really want to sort of keep going, uh, there's an organization called Toastmasters. You know, they just help you with, uh, with public speaking training. Um, and last of all, you, you need to just actually just go out and do it. Right? Um, you can start with team demos, showcases, uh, lunchtime brown bags, um, maybe you're presenting at a local product tank. Um, all of these great, uh, great ways to sort of get comfortable with presenting in, in front of groups. Uh, and this is, for me, one of the largest audiences that I've presented in front of as, as well. Right? So even for me, I'm, I'm still getting used to this kind of thing. My third piece of advice is to optimize your career for learning. Not for money, not for status, but for learning, all right? Um, and the first step is to really be humble. You know, accept that you don't know what you don't know. Um, and then go find out, right? Now, this applies to product managers all around the world, not just here in Asia. But here in Asia, I think it's especially hard because there are just fewer experienced product leaders in this region that you can really learn from. Uh, so what I recommend is uh, look for leaders who have been product managers before. They've actually shipped products that are successful before. They're the types of people that you can really um, learn from. And then look for organizations that really support your learning as well. Right? Uh, to give an example, uh, at Seek Asia, we dedicate every Friday afternoon to learning. Right? Uh, essentially, the entire product delivery organization downs tools, they stop coding, and they go into learning mode. Right? And you'll see different teams and different communities of practice starting to gather together and sort of share knowledge and develop new skills. Um, so that's a huge investment uh, that we make into our people. And you need to look for those kinds of signals in the organizations that you join. Um, it's a huge investment, but I think you know, long term it does really pay off because you continue to see the, the product delivery teams and our product managers in particular, you know, they just keep upping their game. A um, couple of learning resources if you're fairly new to, uh, to product management. Um, if, you're, if you are, oh, let me start again. So I, I, I interview a lot of product managers, right? Uh, it probably runs into the hundreds. Um, 
And what I find with most product managers is that they are self-taught and they're generally from a lot of the smaller organizations, right? Um, and what's needed in typically, typically larger product organizations are some common frameworks and some common approaches, right? Because that's, that's how, you, how you scale and, and how you collaborate at scale. And that's something that you don't normally learn in a smaller, in a smaller organization. So you do need to sort of start to understand some of the frameworks that people typically use uh, and some of the tools that people use uh, in order to, to, to manage this function of, of product management. Uh, so if, if you are uh, new to this, there's an excellent book. Uh, <laughs> Martin actually mentioned Marty Kagan uh, when he introduced me as well. Um, he's got a, a new version of his book uh, published about a year ago called Inspired, How to Create Tech Products That Customers Love. Um, another one of my uh, favorite books is Competing Against Luck uh, by Cl Clay Christensen. Um, he's from Harvard uh, Business School. Uh, both are available from Amazon. If you use my promo code, I get a really nice commission. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, there's a lot of really good free stuff on YouTube and on Audible or you know, podcasts as well. So, so go use these resources, educate yourselves, right? Because that's generally why I reject most people who come for interviews as product managers with me. All right. Um, and being in Asia, it's not all bad, right? It's not all disadvantages. There are actually many advantages to being in Asia uh, as well, uh, besides crazy uh, parents. Um, you have to remember that Lean came out of Asia, right? So the whole concept of Lean um, comes from Toyota Production System, right? So, uh, so it's not all bad. Um, I also find that uh, teams in Asia are highly social. Um, you know, they, they actually hang out with each other at lunchtime, after work, on weekends. Uh, that might be weird to some of you, but if, you know, it's, it's quite normal for, for many of us. Um, and this kind of behavior is actually really good for networking, for consensus building, for collaboration, right? So there are advantages uh, to that as well. But the one that I noticed the most is this one. Um, I've had my fair share of working with brilliant jerks. Um, and, and you can find them all over the world, but I generally find that there are fewer of them in Asia. I don't know why. Uh, maybe they're just hiding uh, and they are out there. <laughs> Um, but I generally find that there's not as many of them, and they're a bit easier to deal with as well, right? Um, and if you really don't want to deal with them, well, you can still, you know, avoid conflict and just ignore them. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>